Welcome to the third orbit, and this is where we are going to be discussing um, um, uh, rationale versus logos, and uh, or also known as TE. Oops, that's like a really gross-looking E. We don't need to have gross E's like that. And also my arrows are terrible too, but I don't care. So TE and TI. So before I begin, let's remind everybody specifically what exactly is cognitive orbit. Okay, so cognitive orbit, it's it's kind of a, an interesting concept, and we've been heavily uh, looking at it within season 23 right now in the uh, journeyman membership. And within season 23, it's like it's the how to parent lectures that we've been doing. We are over halfway done with the uh, how to parent lectures. The next how to parent lecture is how to parent INTJs. I think it will be coming out on Friday, uh, which will be which will be fantastic. How to parent INTJs. But please uh, check that out when it comes. It's it's going to be awesome. And uh, parenting INTJs. It's not as easy as people think. Uh, so, but we just finished uh, ISTJs, and I believe we're re-uploading the how to parent ISTJs because the sound on it was terrible. But our video editor was able to fix that, and you guys should be good to go. Um, so, yeah. Um, uh, please don't cut any of this. Well, the thing is, is that this episode is going to be released publicly, and that's why we cut some things out of it. So yeah, just so you guys know, um, that's why, yeah, so season 18 is actually meant for public consumption uh, because it is emailed out to everybody, but not always. So just, just be aware of that. Like that's a thing and that's why. So, but anyway, um, so, but in, in the context of parenting, cognitive orbit is actually Cognitive orbit, like we've been talking about cognitive synchronicity, and cognitive synchronicity is literally the theory uh, for cognitive compatibility. We haven't touched uh, the other aspect of synchronicity um, where we haven't talked about cognitive asynchronicity. And cognitive asynchronicity, and I'll be doing a five episode series on that very soon, and I should actually probably write down a reminder that I should start writing that down uh that or they should actually get my show notes for that but um cognitive uh, asynchronicity it's when we're going to be talking about like the value of the functions you know being polar opposites and how you can extract as much camaraderie out of that and why uh that's actually you know valuable so we're gonna be looking at that it's kind of like you know having synchronous versus asynchronous orbit, etc., or synchronous and asynchronous axis amongst all the cognitive functions. So that's that's what that's about. We're going to be discussing that a little bit. But in as much as cognitive synchronicity or asynchronicity is actually utilized on a regular basis uh, in our lives on a on, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, you know, um, in terms of compatibility and camaraderie and how to see things from those two different uh, points of view points of view. We, we, we use orbit all the time. And orbit basically is, is this, um, it's like a back door. It's, a, it's like a hidden passageway uh, between the different sides of our mind, but most specifically between our ego and our shadow, also known as our unconscious or our subconscious and our, um, and our super ego, et cetera. And, and don't forget, you know, we really, really do maintain that, you know, an extroverted function is not actually real. An extroverted function doesn't actually exist. It's more of a, a byproduct. It's just like how gravity doesn't actually exist. Um, it's more of a byproduct of what's happening uh, in the universe, etc. Gravity is a byproduct. It's like, it's like an, a, an observable effect that happens, uh, but we just we don't it, it doesn't exist it's just a thing that we observe or it's a thing that happens as a result of another thing well extroverted functions are the same way extroverted functions don't actually exist it's only introverted functions that actually truly exist and it's just because of their existence then it creates you know th those would be the yang within the mind but the yin which technically doesn't exist because it's the chaos that those are extroverted functions so cognitive orbit 
the best way that I could really describe cognitive orbit, and I'm going to get super metaphysical on you right now, is like when you look at the universe, I, I actually completely reject the idea of the Big Bang. I completely reject it. Um, and uh, it's 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 a serious it's a serious problem. And yes, it is it is meta into physical converting these things. Yes, um, it's awesome. Um, but I I reject the Big Bang. I think the Big Bang is fake. I think it's a complete hoax. Uh, I think people should stop paying attention to that. I actually see the universe as uh, an enclosed ecosystem. It's an enclosed ecosystem. Um, kind of like how, you know, you could, I don't know if you ever like were in grade school and your teachers would show you this giant glass bowl thing on a desk and it had like a lot of plants and water and dirt in it. And it's like, it's a self-contained ecosystem. I'm like, oh, is it? They're like, yeah, it's a self-contained ecosystem, meaning that that ecosystem will be teeming with life constantly and it's decaying constantly in perfect yin and yang equilibrium and perfect balance, the self-contained ecosystem. This is what I maintain the universe is. And now, now while people are saying that the universe is ever expanding and going in every direction at once and it's constantly expanding, it's also doing the opposite of expanding. It's also shrinking at the exact same time. And, uh, Yes, cold doesn't exist. It's just absence of heat. Just like gravity doesn't exist, it's um, you know absence of or a byproduct of this thing. That's what extroverted functions are. But really, the best example of this is is that if you were to look at the universe, and it can and it follows all possibility, all extrovert intuition. It follows all ni pathways basically in all directions. Our DNA is the same way, and I've made this argument before in the past, but if you know what the epigenetic genome is, the epigenetic genome is all of the potential, the genetic potential that our genes, our DNA can change in real time. So according to epigenetic theory, every bite you take or every action you take or every behavior you take changes your genes in real time. It changes it in real time, and that's pretty cool. By changing your genes. Now, that's not to say, but the, the universe itself follows its own genome. So you imagine uh, the human genome, the total potential of all human genetic possibility is actually just a big ring, right? It's just a big ring. And a human being is on, you know what? I'm just going to whiteboard this because that would like make a lot more sense. So let's, let's just do that. So, you know, here's human DNA, right? You know, and uh, and then here's 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 Chase right here. That's Chase. That 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 little tiny blue dot, right? And uh, here's uh, here's Potsy. He's over here. He's the red dot, right? And then um, um, and uh, over here, here's Raka. He got a, a purple rainbow thing, you know. But we're all moving in the direction of some kind uh, on this. So we're all moving in a direction maybe pots is actually going in that direction for some reason i don't know but i'm following the crowd i'm, I'm going with raka in this direction and but we are all moving basically on this possible genome so like our dna uh strands are you know going in these different directions etc and we're kind of wrapping around this possible genome, this epigenetic genome, and it's just changing over time. So every, every, everything that's about human nurture in existence changes our genes on a real time, and it changes our genetic expression on in real time. Okay, and then as a result of genetic expression, we are moving across our total human genome potential. Right. It's just that within the context of a human life within a hundred years, they're not going to move that much. They might only experience maybe 0.015% of the entire human genome possibility within one lifetime. Okay, so keep that in mind, right? 
So as a result of this epigenetic process, I'm basically making the argument that when it comes to the universe, let's look at the universe here, the universe has a similar epigenetic genome. And the universe is actually right here. And it's moving. It's moving on this genome constantly. And this genome represents extroverted intuition, also known as every possibility, every endless uh, potential. Um, possible. Ugh, I can't spell. I think whatever, whatever. I, I don't care. Um, potential, all potential futures, all potential realities. Okay, realities. And then the actual reality. This is SE of here. This is what's actually happening. And then that SE happens. And then where the genome has been, right? That is SI, right? And then where is it going? Right? That's NI, okay? Where has it been? Where is it going? As you know, you see what I'm saying? So as a result of that, we know that the universe is, you know, going in this direction. It's going counterclockwise on this model for some reason, but it's going in that direction. It's moving. It's moving. But how is it possible that the universe is able to move on this genome? And this is why everyone thinks the universe is expanding, you know, within this little model right here. How is it able to do that? Well, it's very simple. So um, back here, we have this thing known as white holes, okay? White holes, and I spelled that wrong. Gosh, someone just get me away from a whiteboard. And then we have over here, we have black holes. Yeah. So what is a black hole like? Well, it's like a jet engine, okay? It's a jet engine. It's pulling, okay? So this has force of pull, right? And then this over here has force of push. White holes are pushing out matter. Black holes are sucking in matter, basically. So it's like a jet engine. The front end of the engine is the black hole. The back end of the engine is the white hole, okay? The white hole, the push, the source, right? It's producing, it's the source, okay? So the white hole is effectively source functions, also known as introverted functions introverted functions yeah like ti okay introverted functions nice but then you have you know uh the pole right and that is the extroverted functions right so the extroverted functions are pulling people trying to pull people to them trying to pull that source closer to them etc right so this is the this is the cognition of the universe basically and it's the cognition of the universe basically moving the universe over total potential whatever it is this is why the universe is actually within perfect perfect yin and yang equilibrium you see perfect yin and yang equilibrium and that's why it's constantly in motion constantly in motion and it is exploring all potential reality and this is why it can always keep exploring potential reality this is an aerobarus okay aerobarus yeah this is an aerobarus it's also um the battlestar galactica saying that i like to quote consistently all that has happened before will happen again that is extroverted intuition folks so the universe has this engine system of black holes and white holes of pull and push and is moving itself across all potential. Well, guess what, folks? It's no different for our minds. This is exactly how our minds, you know, go from that direction as well. And it's it's pretty awesome uh, to be able to do that. So anyway, you know, based on this model, the universe is not forever expanding because how could this is this is where I think the laws of thermodynamics actually debunk the Big Bang. And I don't know if I'm quoting Bart Ehrman here, but if I am, please let me know. Uh, or maybe I'm quoting Alan Watts. I'm not sure I'm doing that either. I really don't know. I actually was just thinking about it. But logically speaking, the the 
laws of thermodynamics states that the universe is in a complete state of entropy but also the universe is also in a state of rebirth simultaneously and that rebirth the the entropy um, is like the black holes it's the pole but then the push is also the rebirth at the same time and because the universe is in balance as a result of that it's able to stay in constant motion and the universe effectively stays the same size we're just so small within the universe that we can't really tell that that's happening it you know leave that to god the creator don't like i mean why do we even have to care about this we don't we don't need to know this maybe we do need to know this in order to actually you know develop proper ftl space travel like they did also in battlestar galactica isn't it kind of interesting that the Cylons would use that guy sitting in the tub and having his brain connected to their ship and he was constantly preaching all that has happened before will happen again and yet his entire existence is the faster than light drive system for their Cylon base ship to begin with? Has anyone figured out that they were kind of like informatively stating that space travel has a lot to do uh, with the mind because the universe is effectively following the same exact structure as our souls and our brains and our personas has anyone figured that out yet or hell you could even go as far as frank herbert's dune and the guild of navigators and they navigate to fold space etc for their ftl jumps has anyone figured that out as well anyway the the bottom line is is that yes correct so desire to reach neutral someone in the audience said desire to reach neutral yes just like our bodies are trying to reach homeostasis this is an example of universal homeostasis just like our psyches are trying to reach homeostasis and this is a point that uh mr chris taylor actually had brought up to me recently when his discussion about the superego and that the superego is trying to challenge the ego and it doesn't have respect for the ego like i've said previously but i think that is because the ego is trying the superego is on a mission by providing its challenge it represents the yin while the ego represents the yang within the psyche and it and it represents um it represents the pole um while the ego represents the push basically and uh because it's doing that our brains are working very similarly to the actual drive system of the universe at the same time pretty awesome right but this black hole the white hole system folks it literally is that is what cognitive orbit is that is exactly what cognitive orbit is it's the black hole the extroverted function and its direct link and pathway and conduit into the introverted function or vice versa it could be a it's not just a one-way street it's a, a two-way street um so uh um no i'm not i don't think i'm a monist i don't know why anyone are bringing that up so i i don't see that at all i think the universe can have all potential etc and it uh push and pull etc i don't think let me let me let me actually just define monism here define monism uh just to make sure that i'm correct so monism the view in metaphysics that reality is a unified whole and that all existing things can be ascribed or described by a single concept or system no i think it's a series of systems and a series of concepts uh the doctrine that mind and matter are formed from or reducible to the same ultimate substance or principle of being that's what string theory is based on i i don't i don't agree with that because i think trying to like look for the you know the higgs boson or uh, like the god particle or you know string theory etc uh and i think that's very uh has you know monistic roots uh within it but but no i i don't i don't agree with that either any system of thought which seeks to deduce all the varied uh phenomena of both the physical and spiritual worlds from a single principle specifically the metaphysical doctrine that there is but one substance either mind idealism or matter materialism or a substance that is either mind nor matter but the substantial ground of both I think we are in a dualistic uh, 
a system so especially from you know i am a taoist i don't i don't uh, i don't subscribe to monism that being said i could see how monism technically would have some merit because you could make the argument like there's no such thing as cold there's only absence of heat so heat is the only thing that actually exists so cold doesn't exist and heat is one thing which would technically logically prove that monism is true but I guess it just depends if you really want to say that black holes really exist or if you really want to say that extroverted functions really actually exist uh, if they really do exist if gravity really does exist then you would you would be able to make the argument that it's actually dualism uh but uh, which because of the masculine and the feminine i kind of subscribe to that because i do maintain they're both real and where you have the concrete and the abstract at the same exact time therefore you could say that well concrete is the only thing that exists but honestly that's very reductionist that's very occam's razor and that can actually lead to ignorance and i don't want to take that risk so as a result of that i have to err on the side of caution and actually subscribe to the dualistic view of the universe and not a monistic view of the universe to answer your question good sir in the audience thank you for asking uh so anyway uh, um what if string theory is the concrete push to the abstract any pool yes that's what i'm saying raka yes i i agree with that um and the concrete as he pushed to the abstract yes i i agree with that um so um anyway but the point is is that while the universe is in a constant state of entropy and we have a, a law of diminishing returns with the universe is also in a state a constant state of rebirth and then we have the law of accelerated returns if you want to learn more about the law of accelerated returns read ray kurzweil uh, in his book about the coming singularity also i would like to state that i am not a transhumanist i'm actually against trans transhumanism so like that's a thing please be aware of that thing so um anyway um so using this as a model i just want you guys to know like looking at the universe and the metaphysics involved here uh cognitive orbit follows roughly the same exact pattern uh and when you're looking at you know the four sides of the mind you have to see our four sides of the mind as our own inner internal universe basically just like uh you know and this is where you can get into the uh you know if you go watch episode one of season 17 where i talk about the source of all cognition you could effectively make the argument that the source of all con cognition also known as god the creator etc if God the Creator really exists, then we are perhaps maybe a figment of his imagination. And then we each are a puzzle piece of that imagination such that we have our own inner universe. Also, I really love the song by Ortega, um, composed by Yoko Kano, uh, who uh, is the intro song to Ghost in the Shell Standalone Complex, also titled Inner Universe. It is the dopest. You might want to check that out um so anyway uh that being said um cognitive orbit literally is uh following the identical logic uh, in terms of how it works mechanically within our mind so let's actually do that and uh we're going to be um we're going to be let's look at let's look at a t let's look at um hmm, let's look at an intj let's let's look at an intj right now on this so we're gonna do an intj and uh who else should we do let's do an estp yeah let's do an estp doing something uh interesting about these two types so um, let's get some INTJ going. INTJ, we have NI, we have TE, we have FI, we have SE, uh, we have NE, we have TI, we have FE, and we have SI for its cognitive functions. Then we're going to do an ESTP over here. And then we have SE, and then we have TI, and then we have FE, and then we have NI. That's a horrible NI. I regret making that. And then we have SITEFINE. Okay. 
so we have two people here on our board. So yeah, um, yeah. No, the thing is though, Dio, is that you can still prove things exist without concrete evidence. For example. Uh, a lot of what is unknown within our race and whatnot, because actually recently they proved uh, Einstein's theory of relativity to be true. And they did this by uh, observing a binary star system adjacent to a black hole. And they took pictures of it and they were able to actually track how the light bended up from the stars bended around uh, the black hole. And because they were able to observe that, it literally proved Einstein's theory of relativity, basically. But there was no way to prove it. They just stumbled upon being able to prove it later. Which means extroverted intuition in conjunction with either extroverted thinking or introverted thinking, uh, but especially introverted thinking, it is actually possible using logic alone to prove it even if you don't have any concrete evidence if all you have is abstraction you can still observe the metaphysical world through abstractive perception using extroverted intuition even introverted intuition uh, and then if you are still following a logical system you actually can prove that it is true and know that it is true even though you can't actually bring those metaphysics into the concrete until recently, our race has not been able to prove that the theory of relativity is true, but they actually did, and they did about two years ago. Uh, so that is a, a pretty awesome um, approach. Yeah, well, the, two, the, the time study with two clocks is one thing, but uh, being able to observe the light, and if you're traveling at the same speed as light, you know, are you blind, basically, because you literally can't see anything because you're traveling at the exact same speed, and it's completely and totally dark? That would make sense. You'd have to travel faster to be able to see again or slower to be able to see again. If you're traveling at the same speed, you can't you can't see anything, right? So it's kind of like the reverse Doppler effect. It's it's kind of interesting how that works mechanically. But cognitive orbit, you know, has has a different approach. So so remember, folks, um, you know, we're discussing uh, extroverted thinking to TI and what this specific orbit actually looks like. Now, the reason why I chose these two types is because when you look at these two types, you have a parent function here. And then you have a critic function here. <laughs> and what's interesting about the parent, whenever you have functions that are in the uh, parent and critic, they actually form an orbit of some kind. Uh, and then, you know, it's no different. Uh, it's no different here. Here's the parent and here's the critic. And this is, this is very, this is very special uh, within this particular orbit. The reason why is, is when you have a function in the parent function slot necessary, because of how pessimistic um, these functions are, they're very, very pessimistic. They are sharper. They have higher accuracy. They have higher accuracy as a result. They're not being too optimistic because uh, optimistic functions they tend to make, you know, for example, uh, they make they tend to make leaps. They can be arrogant, so like leaps of logic, for example, um, you know, or le leaps of a uh, of rationale, or uh, they're they're very arrogant. They they take it too far. Uh, optimistic functions, they could take it too far, right? And just looking at the ego versus unconscious here, just you know, for simplicity reasons, because explaining this from a subconscious to a super ego approach is pretty difficult but looking at it here um, like a hero function so like ni hero with what it wants it can be like really impulsive versus an ni parent while still impulsive at least it's responsible so the pessimism allows for parent and critic functions to be more accurate than their other functional counterparts this is why um, I like to call this uh, a capacity for mastery okay so uh, these two types are masters of thinking. Um, now, I understand that we call the trickster function in its super mature form the master function. That's what I'm talking about. That's not what I'm talking about. Obviously, that would be even stronger from a mastery standpoint. But uh, um, 
are things in two different states at the same time when not observed? Uh, I, I don't know. Um, so, so based on that, um, these two things have mastery of thinking. So rationale and TI, which means an INTJ can use TE and TI. They could use them interchangeably. It just takes them a lot more practice and a lot of time to actually get to the point where they're able to use their TI, uh, you know, pretty effectively, right? Uh, just like an ESTP has TE critic, um, so they're 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 able to have more thinking. But if you look at like, let's imagine, let's imagine, you know, if there was like an ISTP. Let's do a, let's look at an ISTP over here, right? T I S E N I F E on this side, and then you have T E. And then, um, uh, excuse me, TE, and then you have SI, you have NE, and then you have FI on this side. What's what's the problem? What's the problem with TI hero and uh, TE nemesis? Well, they're both optimistic. And the thing is, is that they can make, the ISTP can make leaps of logic. And it's because it makes leaps of logic because it is more prone. It's more prone to ignorance. TI hero is more prone to ignorance. It has a higher risk of ignorance than TI parent, right? Than this TI parent over here. Um, the reason why, and remember what the ignorance of TI actually is, it is a uh, preferred input um, or last known uh, input, right? Preferred input versus last known, okay? And this leads to ignorance, but optimistic functions because these functions are trying a lot harder. Pessimistic functions don't try as hard, but optimistic functions do try a lot harder. And this is why an ISTP is not necessarily a master of thinking because from an ISTP st standpoint, that TI hero, it makes leaps of logic. It thinks, it, it, it becomes accustomed to being the hero. It, it's way too accustomed to being the hero. And oftentimes this causes the TI hero to jump to conclusions. But a TI parent, the ESTP, it's not going to jump to conclusions as often. The TI parent is more responsible. The TI parent relies on less on preferred input or less on last known input compared to a TI hero. And while the TI hero is technically on paper the the best processor or po potentially the most intelligent of all the types the the problem is though is that the ti parent still has a higher chance of being more correct and more accurate than the ti hero and that's why you know the hero often adheres to the parent a lot for advice etc it's kind of like Superman always going back to Smallville and, you know, trying to talk to his uh, or going back to the Fortress of Solitude and having a conversation with his father, Jarrell, in the crystals, etc. Because it provides him, uh, you know, with with needed advice, etc. Because the hero can't always do everything on their own. They need the parent because the hero ends up taking it way too far. And they are at risk of making these huge leaps or becoming arrogant. And using TI as an example uh, right now as higher preferred input versus last known input, etc. So, uh, no, it doesn't have to be paired with ignorance. It can be infantile or broken. But again, you you start getting into the um, you start getting into the risk of like, hey, are they cognitive transitioning right now? Is that actually happening? You know, or is it is or is it going through? Is it activating through an orbit instead of a transition? You know, so like, there's a lot of questions that come up with asking that question in response. So I can't really answer it for sure because there's other variables that have to be tracked while you're doing this. So anyway. Uh, the point is, is that, you know, when you're looking at the third orbit uh, in this particular model, it's really just important to understand that when you have parent functions in an orbit uh, with their critic, they end up being the most effective. They have the highest e efficacy for that form of cognition better than other people. This is why ETPs and ITJs are what I call the four masters of thinking. ISTJ, INTJ, ESTP, ENTP. Those people literally have the monopoly on thinking. But then you look at an ENFP, they have monopoly on feeling. 
So um, then you have EFPs, you know, having a monopoly on morality and ethics, just like also uh, IFJs, you know, have that monopoly on, on feeling as well, because they're keeping those functions pessimistic, those decision making uh, functions, uh, you know, pessimistic in there. So, uh, yeah, and uh, so as a result of that, you know, there's there's some issues there, you know, as a result. I don't, okay, hold on. I don't think that is one reason why ISTPs are better than tacticians and ESTP. Now, I could be jumping to a conclusion about what you're saying, and I apologize ahead of time. But SE Hero, um, uh, or yes, I'm sorry, I got that backwards. Yes, I agree. Because SE Parent, you know, in terms of, you know, the ISTP ends up becoming like part of the masters of sensing, the ISTP... Uh, is more likely to be able to unobligate themselves from something than an ESTP because their extroverted sensing parent is more pessimistic. It is more effective, right? So parent functions are more effective, right? Which means critic functions would technically be more effective as well. You do not have this benefit when you're looking at the hero to nemesis approach. Um, so just realize while it takes a little bit more mental energy to utilize the pessimistic functions of your parent and your critic, they are more effective. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that, that, that is a thing. So, uh, so yeah, so I wanted to make this distinction first before, you know, continuing on into, uh, continuing on into, you know, going into the actual orbits here. So I'm going to erase some of these things to uh, make some space here for us. So let me, uh, let me do that. Okay, um, let's get rid of that. Let's get rid of all this. We don't need this. Come on. Okay. All right, let's actually just get rid of these. I don't need this ISTP up here anymore. Okay. You know, it, it's kind of interesting if you think about it because when you look at masters of perception, which would be uh, parent critic functions for perceiving functions, and then you have the masters of sensing between uh, you know, the SI parents and the SE parents, but then you look at the masters of intuition between NE parents and, uh, and, and I parents, those types, it's funny, I have any hero and like my seeing, my prescience can be overreaching. Like I can over prognosticate, I can over predict, I can over uh, conjecture basically. And it's not as accurate. My, my conjecture is not as accurate. That's why I've like hired um, INTPs or INFPs on my team just specifically to ask their any parent, okay, so what do you think is actually going to happen here? And they're they're taking my any hero to school. It's great seeing a parent really taking a hero to school. It happens all the time. So, um, but anyway, so cognitive orbit is super super important. So like using parenting as an example, but it could be useful for anything. Extroverted thinking to introverted uh, thinking or introverted thinking to extroverted thinking. We have two different pathways and they can go down and they can go up. It's a two way street where information is being moved between other things. Now, the problem is, is that like when we look at parenting, when an ego gets older, it starts protecting itself. These functions start protecting themselves and they are protecting their ego investments. And this is one thing that the superego doesn't like that the ego does, is that it sees that the ego gets invested in things and the superego is constantly trying to challenge the ego and to remove its ego investments. Uh, because it's like the ego investments don't really mean that much. They don't really mean that much. And uh, one of the ways that it does this is it does this by doing a cognitive transition itself directly into the unconscious and the uncon and then accesses the back end, the back, the back doors basically into uh, the ego and 
cognitive uh, and that's where you know but then again not only that the ego can actually access the superpowers of the superego by utilizing you know its back doors directly into the superego as well and one of the ways that I've done this personally is create an SI inferior habit through my extroverted sensing demon to access my extroverted sensing demon, my ESFP demons uh, interest awareness in order to protect my SI inferior uh, in a reverse way. Because usually when someone's SI, when someone's inferior function gets hit, the superego activates to come to the aid of the inferior child. It's just like that trope where there is like, uh, a baby, uh, you know, left for dead out in the wilderness, and it just happens to be left for dead out in like a barren wasteland. Uh, and the great, the great demon actually ends up taking the child and raising the child as its own. Um, and actually, a really good example of this in popular culture is Game of Thrones. And if I remember correctly. It might be at the end of season two or season three, but one of uh, Craster's sons are being sacrificed to the White Walkers, also known as the Others. You can see that the great evil of the land, who is the Night King, is starts turning that baby into one of them, basically. And that's an example of the great evil of the super ego uh, coming over, you know, to the inferior and granting its super amazing demonic, mystical, divine powers upon the infant child, basically. And that's what happens when you hit someone's inferior and their superego activates to come to the aid of the inferior function, you know, as a result. Why, how is, why is this relevant? It's relevant because a person could actually utilize cognitive orbit to get into, you know, that there. So let's, and since we're using, you know, TI and TE, we can do that again right here. Let's let's look at um, let's look at um, let's look at an ENFJ for example. Since we're picking on Templars tonight for some reason, so we have an ENFJ right here, and uh, okay, and so. And then you have the TE demon of like, no one's opinions ever. No one gets opinions. I'm not going to listen, blah, blah, blah. And then you have this TI truth, right? And then someone's like, oh, you were stupid. You're stupid, right? And, uh, you know, and then the, the, the TI activates and it goes down through cognitive orbit to the demon, which is the gateway into the super ego, right? It's the gateway into the superego, and then as a result of that gateway, it, uh, you know, all of a sudden, it's able to send its superpowers up to the uh, TI function and give it that way, where the TI function, basically, in order to bolster its truth, it's utilizing the demonic opinion, basically, uh, you know, and then it's able to uh, do it from there and it's able to, you know, protect, you know, the infant because the superego sometimes is like, wow, where's the NI parents taking, taking care of the infant inferior function? Oh, it's not doing its job. So, or it did do its job, but it failed. Okay. And the infant was left in the barren wasteland in my domain, left in my domain. And, uh, the superego is like, okay, um, this ESTJ superego is like, fine, then I will take this little TI inferior and I will become its master, its professor, and teach it the ways and grant my powers upon this very weak infant child, just like in uh, Game of Thrones, basically. So this this is the same thing. It's the same approach, you know, as, as a result, you know, so this is, this is the value of, of cognitive orbit. This is what it's able to accomplish. And this is an example of how opinion can, you know, uh, be supported with truth because what's really important about opinion is that, uh, truth, I just wanted you to say truth or logos, it's proof. But you can't really have proof without 
evidence, right? So what this ENFJ ends up learning, it learns, it starts to learn that in order for people to listen to their truth and not to have their TI inferior stomped on, they end up learning how to gather evidence and to guarantee that their infant is protected they end up bolstering their inferior with additional evidence to make sure that no one else will challenge their TI inferior ever again, right? This is an example of cognitive orbit, okay? This is why I stated in the SISE uh, first cognitive orbit lecture that we did two uh, lectures ago about with my own introvert sensing, that's how I developed the habit. I am triple systematic. That puts me at severe risk. My superego hates it when other people are taking advantage of it. In fact, I had a really great phone conversation with my INTP friend Vicky uh, like last night, and she, ooh, thank God. For a second there, I thought I'd finished that. Um, so she uh she told me something really really important she's like you know chase you really need to make sure that you're taking care of baby chase you got to take care of you your infant child inside of your infant inside of your mind your inferior function and i could tell that you're not i could tell that you're often doing craster's uh child sacrifice i'm inserting that in there because um, that's what craster is doing the child being sacrificed in the north to protect a craster's ego investments, his way of life with his harem of women, etc., at his home north of the wall, in order to, and that's his ego, that's his environment, that's his ego. In order to protect his ego, he has to continuously sacrifice his infants, infant sons, his inferior function, okay? It's the same concept making that sacrifice just like i have to sacrifice my si when i'm constantly being loyal to church or loyal to women i shouldn't be loyal to or loyal to addictions i shouldn't be loyal to or loyal to experiences i shouldn't be loyal to or loyal to systems or ways of thinking or social norms or organizations or ideals i shouldn't be loyal to right my super ego is like what the hell? You shouldn't be loyal to that. And the super ego is like, fine. You have all those stupid ego investments. I'm going to come and destroy you and wipe you out. The White Walkers are going to come and destroy you and wipe Craster out, out of Craster's keep. And so instead of doing that, he's like, I'm just going to sacrifice my infant inferior function to you instead. And then the super ego is fine. I'll take your inferior and then I'll make it my own. You see? That's an example of cognitive orbit directly within our extroverted intuition tropes, hero's journey, and mythology right there. Game of Thrones is a mythos. The Song of Ice and Fire is a mythos, okay? So this is, this is literally how this happens mechanically within our heads on a daily basis, okay? When you're looking at, you know, the superego as a result. Um... So this is a thing, okay? So cognitive orbit, you have to be aware that there is, you know, some limitations as a result. You know, uh, well, I don't know if it's limitations, but when you're looking at when you're looking at other types, like other than like you know ENFJs, if you were to take a uh, you know like an INTJ and whatnot, you know, they end up. Their orbit is like this, is that like, I got to know the truth. I got to know the truth. I got to know the truth. That critic is demanding the truth because the, uh, because the super ego is trying to pull, pull hard towards the ego, pull the ego down to itself so it could hopefully replace the ego, basically. But it's doing this through the influence of the unconscious, and it's trying to get, and, and it could also do it through the influence of the subconscious, but that's another discussion later. That's actually more cognitive axis than it is cognitive orbit. But by doing this, you know, through cognitive orbit, you know, on the lower side of the mind, the lower four functions, the unconscious, as it were, uh, doing the unconscious and doing it that way, it's it's because it's trying to get those energies, and those are the back doors between, you know, to the ego itself, you know. So the INTJ is like, oh, hey, you know, 
I need to go gather, I need to have evidence, I have to have an amazing opinion. But the thing is, is that the orbit's like, well, wait a minute, how do I know my opinion's actually true? What if my opinion's not true? What do I do there? You know, and that could be a serious problem. How do I know, how do I know my opinion is correct? How do I know my TE opinion is, is true? So, so what happens is, is that when you have this orbit, this TI critic, they're very critical. They're, they're very, you know, almost like grandparents or they're very senile elders and the senile elder, it's like, okay, I know the truth. I know the truth, but I forgot. I need to know the truth again, but I forgot. I need to know the truth again, but I forgot. And that can be very difficult for an INTJ. It's one of the reasons why it doesn't matter how many times they take the discover test at csjoseph.life forward slash discover that they end up hiring me for a typing session anyway, because they're like, I just need to know. I just need to know. I just need to know. I need to gather evidence. I need something external to validate what I already know is true because their ego wants to have its ego investments, right? Because the TE is not satisfied, even though the 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 test and the ev and everything they have up there is telling their TI, okay, yes, it, I know I'm an INTJ, I know I'm an INTJ, but the TE is like, but you don't have any external evidence for that, right? And it's a problem. It's 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 a huge problem. So yeah, Andy Chow calls it the research positive feedback loop. It never ends. It really never ends. Yeah, what's in the basement? Okay, yeah. And you reap what you sow. Yes, exactly. Um, so it's it's a problem. It's it's a serious problem for this for this cognitive orbit. But really, it comes down to like, in order to have a complete view of truth, you can't. Uh, um, you have to look at TE and TI as um, you know. Oh, this is the pathway by which we get to truth overall you know, how to get there, um, you know, and what we're getting there with, it's a little bit different. You have to have both. You really, really have to have both. Because here's the thing, like you look at an ENFJ or an ESFJ, they have TI inferior, they have TE demon, you know, or they're not really going to have as much truth awareness. Now, a TI child will have a little bit more because TI, its logo says logical. You can arrive to a truth regardless of the input that it's working with. But being able to gather input at the same time or gather evidence at the same time and then extract truth from that uh, through you know processing the, that input or that evidence, it's, it's going to have a higher chances of arriving to a truth conclusion. So, so really, I often say that TI is like truth oriented. It's technically not. Um, it's it's more of like facts, you know, or concrete facts, right? Whereas TE is more actually abstract facts. They're abstract. They're abstractions. So, and you have abstract factions, and then the TI turns into the concrete, and then the result is truth basically, you know, and it works and it works in that direction. But if you don't understand, you know, truth, uh, you know, from that standpoint, and this is why, you know, like, I'm like, yeah, TI users, they're closer to the truth. Yes, they are closer to the truth. They have the TI facts because all the TI users around them, they could still grab those abstract facts or those TI users are going to provide those abstract facts to the TI users to turn them into concrete facts. And then it's over. And then the TI users are the ones who ends up knowing the truth. They end up holding the truth. They end up being the source of truth as a result. But still, those concrete facts still require the abstract facts first in order for them to reach those conclusions to begin with. And it goes both ways, you know, because you have an INTJ who's all about having those abstract facts gathering up of this evidence. It's kind of like what my friend, uh, Alex, he's an ESTP. He says conspiracy theories are two things. A conspiracy theory is a story without evidence which is a TI without TE, or it is evidence without a story. It's a bunch of TE without TI, essentially, right? And that is what this cognitive orbit is all about. That's literally what it means. 
So TI child is most likely to achieve concrete facts. Um, I kind of think TI parent is the most likely to achieve concrete facts. However, TI child is so innocent with the concrete facts that it has the, um, because they lack extroverted thinking so much and they lack their ability because here's the problem with TI child. TE trickster within its cognitive orbit TE trickster absorbs and it is willing to listen to anybody. It's willing to listen to anything. It's willing to gather up any evidence, even if that evidence is fake. It wasn't gathered in a responsible way. They will look at any evidence, any evidence, and then they will process any evidence. So their output, their output that comes up, their FE output, because remember, you have that process of TE, TI, FE, FI, input, process, output, feedback in that order which is what we first started with at the beginning of cognitive mechanics, that feedback loop, basically, that system, um, because they're, a, they're willing to look at any evidence, guess what? Their TI child can come to any conclusion. This is why INFJs think crystals have magic in them. This is, you know, like, uh, as an example, this is why INFJs are often involved with the occult or mysticism or spirituality or different belief systems, very fringe, taboo belief systems even. It's because they're willing to sit down and consider any evidence, which just triggers their ENFP golden pairs because their golden pairs are like, their T child is like, uh, that evidence is literally worthless. Why are you spending so much time looking at worthless evidence? You are arriving to the wrong conclusions and thinking that things are true because the evidence that you are processing, those abstract facts that you're looking at, they're so abstract, so they're not technically facts, I guess. Um, those abstract factoids, I guess you could call them. Uh, I'm sorry, but you're wrong and you're always going to think about things incorrectly. Here's some abstract facts that are actually handled in a responsible manner and to get you thinking about the proper things so you actually can arrive to the concrete conclusions. So an, I, an INFJ is literally just a data processor, but the problem is if you leave them on their own to gather up their own evidence, to gather up their own input, they're going to fail. That's why they need the TE user around them to help them. Yes, TE trickster can be helpful because a lot of evidence and input that an INFJ can gather, there's a 50-50 chance, right, in general, that that evidence could be good evidence versus bad evidence, right? It could be collected well or it could have not have been collected well. There's a 50-50 chance. So ultimately, TI is still able to get through it. And the other advantage of TI child is that it's a child and it doesn't run out of energy. A TI parent does run out of energy. And a TI child, because it doesn't run out of energy, it can keep nitpicking and it will eventually nitpick everything and re-verify everything it already knows anyway to make sure that it still is true. This is why TI child can still ultimately arrive at the most divine level of truth, but it's also for that same reason that they can be their TI can be heavily corrupted. And that's why an INFJ or an ISFJ can be insanely dogmatic. A dogmatic IFJ is a corrupt TI child with the wrong input, right? So they, what they end up having to do is they have to keep listening to new input, even input that would disagree with their TI child and keep listening to new input and not close themselves off so as to guarantee that their TI child stays pure, okay, within this cognitive orbit. It's absolutely important. It is, it is critical to have that. Purity of TI child literally means listening to things to that they either don't want to do or things that make them uncomfortable and then spending the time to actually verify if that's true. And then they can adjust themselves as a result. They have to keep doing this over and over and over. If they don't do that, well, then they're going to become ignorant and then their TI is going to be corrupt and they're going to think it's okay to rob a store on behalf of somebody else. They're going to think it's okay to be a prostitute for someone else's sake, which I've met INFJs that way. And, oh my gosh.
that was a scary time in my life. Glad I'm not doing that anymore. Being around those people, ugh, that was so bad. The, the story is that um, I was on a dating app one time, and I went, and she ended up actually being a prostitute, and I had no no thanks. It can be a thing, but you know, with TI child though, you got to be careful because you can easily manipulate a TI child by pr by pre-programming them. Uh, so that can be a problem. I don't I'm having some drop frames right now. All right, I have successfully restarted the stream, so that should improve the stream health. All right, cool. So yeah, so these are all examples of how cognitive orbit actually works when it comes to TI versus TE, um, and. Uh, in order for TI to be effective in arriving to the actual concrete facts, the truth, basically, it still requires to have, you know, good input. Some people, like the TE users, when they need to use their orbit to gather evidence first before they allow themselves to think something is true, right? That's the first example of, of cognitive orbit. Then there are the TI users who already think they know what is true and will only gather evidence that supports what they already know. And that is what pisses off TE users all the time because TE users are like, well, hold the phone. You didn't gather enough evidence. I go out of my way to gather evidence before I allow myself to think something is true. You TI users only gather evidence to support what you already think is true. That is bias, okay? All TI users do that. All of them do that. Luckily, I'm TI parent, and I do that the least because I'm responsible. I am so glad I have TI parents. So thankful that I have TI parent. I could not imagine living as a TI inferior. I could not imagine doing that. And being that, um, you know, I, I just, I, I, I couldn't. And I'm not begging on TI inferiors when I say that, but... I could see how a lot of TE users see a TI inferior as an intellectual burden on them, where they're constantly having to provide evidence to that TI inferior just to help take care of that TI inferior, that TI infant person. And it's uh, it's a thing. And this is this is why this is why uh, TE users consistently say that TI users are ignorant or why they're biased or how they, uh, you know, they rely on last known input or preferred input, basically. And all TI users do this. The more responsible TI user, the less they actually do this. And over time, though, a TI inferior can end up through aspiration becoming the absolute most responsible uh, when it comes to uh, truth, but it takes an entire lifetime for them to get there because they're able to actually access their superego's uh, demon angelic power basically through their infant function via cognitive orbit to make it the absolute strongest and even stronger than a TI parent. It can happen. An example of this is using the first orbit, which is SI versus SE. I'm able to uh, access my ESFP superego uh, performance and interest-based capabilities to use that to strengthen my SI into SI aspirational such that I'm able to access those energies mentally to become the super strong SI user to the point where no one can out endure me and no one can out persevere me no one can out suffer me and I will always be the last man standing right so that's another example of that. And you can see examples of that cognitive orbit in the movie Ender's Game with Harrison Ford, uh, especially um, looking at the fight uh, between one of the team leaders and the main character, Ender Wigan, who is an ENTP, and he's literally accessing his SE demon to strengthen his SI inferior suffering, etc., to persevere. And he's able to defeat his enemy while also removing his enemy's opportunities for any future potential conflict by basically making sure the enemy has no ability to retaliate. That's an example of the SI, SE, SI inferior to SE demon cognitive orbit, right? That's how it goes. So, uh, and yes, as Helen Shang says, it is a form of stubborn. Um, so... 
Um, so willpower is always just finding a pathway forward, a, a, a way to escape. It's like being an escape artist. Um, NI willpower is like being an escape artist, you know, an NI inferior, an ESTP using its cognitive orbit to become an escape artist where it uses the NE demons capability through the ENFP superego to always create an opportunity for its NI inferior to escape any situation, right? ESTPs are amazing at being escape artists. It's unbelievable. They are always able to free themselves every single time, and that's why, provided their NI is aspirational. Up until that point, their NI is often in shackles, and that can be a problem. So uh, be aware of that. So we're kind of getting a little bit off topic here because it's supposed to be about TE versus TI in this third orbit, basically. But in general, understand that that's how these two different uh, approaches go. The high TE users go out of the way to gather evidence first uh, before... Um, and they end up gathering evidence first before they allow themselves to come to a true conclusion. The TI users uh, are verifying evidence, basically. Uh, verifying evidence because they're trying to find the value in the evidence. They're trying to find the FI in the evidence, basically, uh, and uh, they'll throw it out if there is no. So they're processing that evidence, uh, basically. Um, the thing is, is that oftentimes when they're able to use their logic, they only want to find the evidence that supports their um, their views. So technically, this is why a TI use or a TE user is technically more open-minded than a TI user because TI users are prone to being stubborn. And this is why I say technically the ENFP out of all the 16 types is the most open-minded of all the types. But that open-mindedness is absolutely necessary because that's how we as a race gain forgiveness. Because um, an ENFP um, through its wise INFJ shadow, its FE critic, as well as, uh, you know, its everlasting sympathy, you know, and we'll, we'll talk about this in the next episode. It literally can find grace and forgiveness literally for anybody, and which is important because we're going to need that before we as a race are completely tossed away uh, in the fire. So that's uh, kind of how it goes. Can you be stuck in a T-I-T-E loop? Um, so guys, that's the end of this lecture. Thanks for watching. We're going to go into our Q&A uh, mode now, but please keep the questions related to this lecture. Can you be stuck in a T-I-T-E loop? Absolutely you can, but uh, not, in the, not in the same way that cognitive looping is generally understood. It's more of, it's more of, uh, you know, like, a, like me as a T-I parent, I'm not willing to go forward until I absolutely have the correct evidence because my TE critic is forcing me to gather evidence so that I know for a fact that what my TI parent believes is true or knows is true is actually true. And then it, it, it can get in the way and I can lead to stagnation sometimes because I can get an analysis paralysis. It's no different than like say for example an INTJ or an ISTJ. They get stuck gathering evidence to uh, come to a true conclusion, and sometimes they've already gathered enough evidence, but for some reason, they doubt that they have enough evidence, and they keep gathering evidence, and more evidence and more evidence, and then they get stuck in gathering the evidence, and they're not willing to accept that what they already know is true. That's the other direction, you know, in terms of uh, the third cognitive orbit. Okay. What was that about TI child uh, pre-programming? I cut it out for that. Okay, so TI child pre-programming um, basically is what you do is is that you completely control the input that the TI child has. Um, it's where you're preventing the TI child from gathering its own evidence and the TI child is completely dependent on you gathering evidence for it. The TI child is outsourced the evidence gathering to another person and which effectively allows the other person to control the life of the TI child. Completely control them. I've seen it happen multiple times for ISFJs and INFJs. In ISFJs, my typical go-to argument is like how church and being in a church group and the social norms of a church group and like a church cult, etc. Like my mother, 
all of that input was being controlled by the TE child's ENFP pastor. And she basically wasn't thinking for herself because she was outsourcing all of her input in terms of her dogma and how she was uh, living her life as a result of somebody else's input that they were choosing to give her. And that input benefited her because they knew that she would think about things in a certain way that would benefit them. Um, another way to look at it is the feminine primary social order has conditioned men uh, in such a way where it is limiting uh, certain inputs, certain truths to be certain evidences to be known to men. It's kind of like book burning so that those TI child men can only arrive to conclusions that will ultimately force them to continue to be subservient to the feminine primary social order. That is an example of pre-programming uh, TI child by literally controlling and being the gatekeeper of the input. ENFPs do this all the time. ESFPs do this all the time, but it's especially bad with ENFPs. Even INFPs do it. But ENFPs, I've seen it done the most where they like to put themselves in a position as gatekeeper and they filter in all of the information between the people beneath them and the people above them. And they end up being able, since they are an information nexus, they end up being able to control people above them and people below them simultaneously. And they eventually are able to be in the positions of power over both parties because they're the one who controls which information is known by who, basically, which is really, really dark and fucked up, if you ask me. So, all right. Um, so to get out, need more info. Yeah, you have to be willing, if you're a TI child and you're concerned that you're being pre-programmed, you have to, in order to see the light, the light being the truth, in order to see the light, you have to be willing to risk the dark, which means like my mother would be have to be have to be willing to go listen to other things that is not typical to the input, the preferred input that she is comfortable to receive from my ENFP former pastor, etc. That's how you on the way out. It literally comes down to verify and verify everything with your TI. By verifying, trust what they say, but always verify, that's how you get out of it. Um, uh, so yeah, so an INFJ needs others to arrive at the truth of TI yet should not be around others that those others have bad morals. That's not exactly what I'm saying. Just verify. Um, okay. So you have to look for new external sources to verify, not just one source. Also very true. Um, and, uh, yeah, awesome. Okay. Well, I don't see any other, uh, questions coming in right now. And I think we're doing pretty good here otherwise. Um, so yeah, folks, um, I hope you uh, enjoyed uh, this lecture, Season 18, Cognitive Command, uh, Mechanics, uh, The Third Orbit, TE to uh, TI, uh, Extroverted Thinking to Introverted Thinking, Rationale to Logic or Logos. Uh, based on that, um, thank you all for watching uh, this month's uh, live lecture for those of you who are members. If you want to become a member, please become a member at csjoseph.life forward slash members. And uh, that would be awesome if you guys would join us next month for the next episode. If you're receiving this by email, awesome. If you're missing some episodes in season 18 because you don't have the link, you can actually watch all of them at uh, our portal, csjoseph.life forward slash portal, but you have to be a journeyman member in order to access the season 18 content uh, specifically. So anyway, I hope you folks found this useful and helpful in your lives. And uh, that's awesome. So anywho, with all that being said, folks, I'll see you guys tonight.